Hello, everyone. I see some familiar faces. Um, we just want to say uh, hello. Uh, we're uh, we're just waiting here. Hopefully, we uh, get a couple more folks. Uh, we know that everyone's sort of coming in at lunchtime here, so uh, just giving enough time to uh, to get on board. Um, I just want to say thank you, thank you for being here today. Uh, this is a great honor for all of us, and we're going to do a formal introduction in just a moment. But um, what we would like you to do before we get started, if you could put your name and your college in the chat, please. Um, so go ahead, put your name uh, as well as your institution in the chat. Um, and this is particularly important for a lot of our community college folks who are getting professional development credit. This way we know um, your name and uh, also uh, your institution. So again, welcome. Well, I just want to say thank you for being here. This is our second semester of Civic Dialogues, and we are so happy to welcome uh, many returning uh, speakers, or excuse me, uh, participants, as well as new participants. Um, I'm just so excited. In fact, I'm so excited because I see one of our upcoming presenters. She's hiding there in her tile, but I am, I'm like a huge fan of all the presenters that we bring uh, to our series. So this is a real honor for us. Um, my name is Patty Robinson. I am the Director of Civic and Community Engagement at College of the Canyons. Uh, our college is located in North Los Angeles County. And I am joined by two um, amazing uh, colleagues, uh, Kimberly Rosenfeld, who is Chair of Communication Studies at Cerritos College, and then also Jan Cano, uh, Emeritus of Cerritos College and uh, 3CSN, uh, that's our California Community College a Success Network, uh, and she is a facilitator. Um, Cerritos is also located in, in Southern California uh, as well, more in the heart of Southern California. Uh, so with that, again, we also want to thank our 3CSN group. Um, uh, Keelan and Rebecca are not on the uh, Zoom today, but they have been significant players in getting this to, to just be a, 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 a weekly kind of presentation series that we had last semester and also this semester. So some of you who are joining us for the first time, you might be wondering, how did this all begin? Well, it began last semester as part of an intersegmental partnership addressing how to create a civic engagement pathway between the California Community College system and our California State University system. And for those of you who maybe are not as familiar with our system in, in California, we have 116 community colleges and, um, oh gosh, I'm going to say 23 CSUs. I, I, there may be a 24th by now, I apologize. But the idea is, is that um, we have most of our community college students who transfer go to our CSU system. And so a group of us started working on a project based on a Bringing Theory to Practice grant where we wanted to begin looking at this idea of creating a civic engagement pathway. The original partners were College of the Canyons, Cerritos, Cal State Dominguez Hills, and Cal State Northridge. We were fortunate enough to recently receive a second Bringing Theory to Practice grant to continue our work, and we welcome to our original team, Cal State Los Angeles and uh, Los Angeles City College. So we are really thrilled to be able to start putting this series uh, together, uh, not just for one semester, we are now into our second semester, and this is going to hopefully continue on for semesters to come. Um, and we actually started this series with a desire to foster greater understanding of civic learning and democratic engagement, really following the, the uh, path of a, a crucible moment. And so with that, we found that there was great interest in this topic as we started this lecture series. Um, and just for those of you who are joining for the first time, our previous speakers from last semester, uh, all of these sessions have been recorded and they are available uh, on a YouTube station through um, our channel, I should say, through 3CSN. So you can take a look at some of our, our previous speakers as well. Today's presentation is comprised of two parts. We have our first hour with our, our guest speaker, um, which will include a conversation and questions. You will have an opportunity to place your questions in the chat and then also to uh, ask uh, Dr. Matthew questions uh, in person if you'd like to later on in, the, uh, in this first hour. The second hour is followed by a deeper dive and Kimberly, Jan, and I will provide um, a deeper dive into the, the work that comes out of today's um, presentation by Dr. Matthews. 
And with that, I want to take a moment to um, introduce our incredibly um, esteemed guest uh, speaker today. Um, it is with much pleasure that I introduce Dr. David Matthews. Um, he doesn't know it, but I am I'm a fan. I, I want to tell you, I, I love reading his work. He's just um, a, a, a powerhouse in the field of civic learning and democratic engagement. Uh, Dr. Matthews is president and CEO of the Kettering Foundation and directs the studies of the Foundation's Cousins Research Group. Prior to his work with the Foundation, he served as Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare in the Ford Administration. From 1965 to 1980, he taught history at the University of Alabama, where he also served as president from 1969 to 1980. Dr. Matthews has written extensively on Southern history, public policy, community problem solving, education, uh, and international relations. His books include Politics for People, Finding a Responsible Public Voice, and The Ecology of Democracy, Finding Ways to Have a Stronger Hand in Shaping Our Future. He has served on the boards of a variety of organizations, including the Gerald R. Ford Foundation, National Issues Forums Institute, Center for Citizenship, Community and Democracy, Southern Institute on Children and Families, PACERS, and Public Agenda. In 2007, the Alabama Center for Civic Life was renamed in his honor. He is also the recipient of 17 honorary degrees. Dr. Matthews earned a BA a degree in history and classical Greek after graduating Phi Beta Kappa from the University of Alabama. He received his PhD in history from Columbia University. And Dr. Matthews is a serious gardener and amateur uh, landscaper. I need to get him at my house. Uh, he is married to Mary Chapman Matthews. They have two daughters and six grandchildren. And I just wanna tell you, this man has written extensively on the topic of civic engagement. And he's here today to share um, part of his latest work, uh, the idea of democracy with the people. And so with that, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Matthews. I'm uh, grateful for this opportunity. I'm much more interested in what you have to say than what I will have to say. So I'll be brief and get right to the point. The point is that democracy is in trouble. And because democracy is in trouble, higher education is in trouble. Only a few years ago, we had a few warnings that democracy had weakened to the point that it was going to be in trouble. And now everybody, most everybody will acknowledge it is in trouble and in deep trouble. We're not just facing problems in democratic societies, we're facing problems in democracy itself. This isn't new. The trends, the erosion have been going on at least since the 1960s. And they're not confined to the United States. You'll find uh, these same things happening in most of the developed world, particularly in uh, Europe, Australia, uh, other places. This is serious business. And we're not going to get out of it soon. It wasn't caused by one election, and it's not going to be solved by another election. There are a number of ways to get at these problems. Kettering's a research foundation. And we do it uh, by looking as carefully as we can at the role that citizens do and don't play and the alienation, and I, I choose that word carefully, the alienation of large numbers of people 
from the existing political system. They don't think it's theirs. They don't think it represents them. They don't think they can trust it. And particularly, they don't think they can trust the authoritarian, the, not authoritarian, uh, the authority that these institutions are accustomed to having. And that includes the press, it includes the scientific community. And most of all, it includes not just government, but higher education. I'm not telling you anything new. You've already begun to feel the effects on the defunding of higher education. Higher education was once seen as a public good serving a public good. And for that reason, uh, legislative bodies uh, felt obliged uh, to support it. We did some research a few years ago to ask people about the uh, public mission of higher education. <clears throat> Most people had no idea what we were talking about. To them, higher education was a consumer good and they weren't entirely sure uh, that they were getting the quality uh, that they were paying for and they were unhappy. That's ironic because the institutions of higher education were most all created to serve democracy, uh, particularly to expand suffrage. Uh, first, uh, with people in the agricultural and mechanical uh, occupations, the AM colleges, later universities, then uh, uh, African-Americans, uh, uh, then women, then tribal colleges and on up through the colleges that are in your group. Uh, first called junior, now called community colleges. People just don't see any connection between them and the problems of democracy that they now see very vividly, shockingly, and they don't know what to do about it. We've looked at our research on this, which goes back over 40 years. And uh, we were much reminded of Abraham Lincoln's plea for a government of the people by the people, for the people. You ask folks now, if we have a government of the people, uh, they wouldn't agree. By the people, you gotta be kidding. For the people, well, maybe for some people sometimes. What about more government with the people? We do that when there's a disaster, ask the folks in, Texas now, who are dealing with uh, flooding and, and severe weather, freezing even. Uh, but we don't do it as a regular matter of policy or practice. And our authoritative institutions, our authoritative institutions were not built to work with the people take higher education. For good reasons, higher education was built to deal with citizens as parents, as consumers, as alumni, as donors. They are the uh, patients for the medical schools. They are the clients for the law school. They are the consumers for the business schools. What would it mean to deal with citizens as producers and not simply consumers? We weren't built to do that. We weren't built to do that. Nor were most of the other authoritarian institutions. So, so there's a real imperative, a real need uh, to rethink 
what higher education does and reconnect it with democracy. And that's what we're working on now. We're looking for experiments uh, where institutions are trying to forge a new relationship with democracy and with its citizens. There, I can tell you, uh, there are not many cases right now to look at. There are a few. Uh, uh, and we are eager to find more which is the reason that I really welcome the opportunity to teach this seminar or to appear in this seminar and to hear your questions. So I'm from Alabama and as a very famous Alabamian, Forrest Gump said, that's all I have to say about that right now. I'm looking forward to your questions. I know we have um, folks that are, are thinking about this, and I, and I I think one of the things that would be really interesting, Dr. Matthews, um, you use the term um, producers, and I also know in in um, your work you refer to this concept of, of co-producing. Um, and could you actually explain what you mean by this? Because I think I think for a lot of folks that this is a term that that maybe they haven't really thought about. <laughs> And especially as you're, you're talking about the idea of looking at clients, patients, um, you know, having those kinds of, of, of terms that we use, again, really you're reframing how we should be thinking about higher education. And I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit, please. Sure. Um, producers make things. And because they can make things, they have power. That's the that's the way they can make a difference. They make things. Um, it can be as simple as people getting together uh, to pick up litter. It can be as simple as they're coming together in a neighborhood to, to build a park to keep kids off the street. It can be as profound and national as getting together to create uh, the civil rights movement. Uh, when people are producers, they can make a difference. They belong because they own what they make. Right now, unfortunately, people don't have that sense of citizenship. Uh, maybe some at the local level, but nationally, no. Uh, so what would it mean if higher education treated citizens as producers? There's one experiment that we watched very carefully at, at uh, Wake Forest University. For some reason, a group of faculty got dissatisfied with the uh, way they were preparing uh, young people, their students for citizenship. And they looked at our work, which says, you know, production, and here I mean collective uh, uh, production, things that we do together. Uh, they, they looked at that and, and all uh, collective produ uh, production begins in collective decisions. What is it we're going to make? What is it we're going to do? So they focused on those and they began to teach uh, their students how to deliberate with people who were not necessarily like them, who didn't necessarily like them, but they needed to get something produced. And uh, we pitched in and helped uh, using our research on how to reframe issues for public deliberation. Let me pause on that a little bit. Uh, by deliberation, I mean making a decision in which we weigh the values uh, that we are committed to against the things that we might do. We do that all the time. It's nothing strange or magical about it. Uh, think back to when you were deciding where you were going to go to school, or think back when you were deciding what career you would pursue. You looked at your options, you weighed them against what was deeply important to you, and you made exercise the best judgment you could about what was best for you. That's deliberation. It's a natural uh, human fact. The brains, are, our brains are programmed uh, for that. 
but unfortunately, we don't always deliberate when we should. And we, we, as a result, we make hasty, uh, ill-advised decisions uh, that we regret. So at Wake Forest, they taught their students how to deliberate with people to make things. And they measured that after four years against uh, the students that had not been in this uh, particular track. And uh, the students had been, who'd, who'd been in the regular college curriculum, political science and, you know, what was citizenship like? Well, it, it, uh, it's a great thing and I'm gonna be a good citizen. You can count on that. But you know, right now I got all these loans I got to pay off and I got to get a job. And well, I was kind of thinking about getting married but as soon as I get through with that, then I'm gonna be a good citizen. This, uh, the students who had been in the, in, in the deliberative democracy program, very different. Politics was something they did every day. It wasn't something that politicians did and it wasn't confined to elections. They did it every day and they knew how to do it. They knew something about how uh, to work with people that they didn't agree with and didn't agree with them. And they did it on campus. They did it in the uh, community or surrounding Wake Forest. Uh, it was so uh, Im important to Wake Forest that they started recruiting students uh, based on the fact that we're gonna teach you how to work with and make things and make a difference in this, in this world. Um, 10 years later, they went back to see what happened. Now, I don't know what you remember about your college days, but 10 years out of college, I could barely remember I had been there. I certainly couldn't remember very much of the coursework that I had had. But 10 years later, these students in this program had the same attitudes. They were doing the same kind of things uh, that like, so you can uh, get a copy of their book from uh, the Kettering uh, Foundation Press. Uh, so that's uh, an experiment of the kind that we're looking for in which people are addressing for their own reason, not ours their own reasons, one of the key uh, leverage points, dealing with one of the key leverage points in politics. All politics is about collective action, uh, voluntary collection action. And so it has, to, it has to be preceded by some decision about what that action could be. And in fact, we are constantly deciding even as we are acting, it goes back and forth. So uh, that's an uh, illustration of treating students as producers. Producers have to make something together with other people. And to do that, they have to make hopefully good decisions with those people. Boy, that was a long answer to the <laughs> question. I'm sorry. So Dr. Matthews, um, I have, a question, and that is, well, first a statement that I kind of think that education dropped the ball, that we have not lived up to our highest goal and our highest mission about creating, you know, um, a democratic, civically engaged population. And so I'm wondering what thoughts you have about how can we get back on the right track? What do we need to do to motivate our institutions to, to want to put this as their primary or you know, move it up the, the decision chain? Yeah. Um, because that's, it's so important. And I agree with what you are presenting. I just am a little short uh, sighted about what we need to do uh, to get back on track? Well, I've been out of higher education for a long time. And so I don't have as good a sense of what's happening now as you do. But my impression, my impression is that institutions of higher education are um, beleaguered, uh, beset, 
uh, financial problems, campus problems, um, and they're preoccupied making uh, a way to serve democracy better probably is only something that's going to appeal to a very few far-sighted people. But here's what I'm hoping, is that people would see the connection between their troubles and the benefits that they could reap from co-producing education with their students, with the professionals around them, co-producing education. Uh, there's a lot of education that goes on uh, out there and educational institutions that are beleaguered for their very practical self-interest uh, could uh, uh, benefit themselves, do themselves a favor uh, by addressing uh, the people that come to them as producers who can make things in education. And that uh, if students were more the producers of their education, more the producers of their education than simply the audience uh, for what they are taught, if they were co-producers, um, I think we would have better education. And I would think that institutions uh, would have an easier chance um, I say that there's a Nobel Prize winner in our, uh, right next to our, our campus here, uh, Eleanor Ostrom, who won the Nobel Prize a few years ago by showing that our strongest, our best institutions can't really do their job without what she called the co-production or I would call the complementary production of public goods. Um, that, prize and, and, and that work unfortunately has been on the shelf too long, but it, it's a, uh, it, it, it certainly uh, is compatible with what I'm arguing here. Involve students in co-producing their education. Dr. Matthews, we have three questions in the chat, so I'm going to jump in and read one to you from Susan Sergis, who asks, in your opinion, how does diversity valuation factor into how we build a democracy that can sustain us as we move forward? How can they uh, uh, get into the evaluation? Did I hear that correctly? Yeah, how, how does diversity valuation factor into how we, we build a democracy that can sustain us as we move forward? And maybe Suzanne, you, you wanna jump in and clarify your question a little bit? I apologize for how I worded that. Um, how do we value diversity in such a way that it's going to help us promote and um, strengthen our democracy rather than see it as a hindrance or something that has to be dealt with? How do we use the parts of diversity where innovation happens, when um, diverse perspectives come into the room and things can be created that otherwise couldn't have been if there was too much group think, if there was too much similarity, if people were like us, how do we find ways to move forward when there are people not like us, but have positive results? Um, Given a little thought to that, um, would you like to see the most diverse individual in the United States? If I could show you the most diverse person what would they look like? You can find out by looking in the mirror. You're a composite of eons of evolution. Uh, you are a walking United Nations, whoever you are. And we, do, we don't have to produce diversity, it's there, it's there. We're not in total agreement with any other human being, not even those that are closest to us. And what we've, uh, one of the things we've studied in uh, deliberative politics is how people come 
uh, to take a broader view, to listen to other people, to not be trapped in some uh, bubble here, there, beyond. And what does it is when they hear the experiences of other human beings, the experiences of other human beings. Um, I remember in one forum, it was on uh, um, abortion, very controversial. And uh, one of the most vociferous opponents of democracy, of, of abortion in a democracy, was a young woman who in the course of stating her position, confessed that she herself had had an abortion. Well, it shocked the group. I mean, there wasn't a, but that very human story, not an elaborate uh, argument, uh, not uh, clever persuasion, not a group of fact, that human story made people willing to listen to other points of view because they saw how excruciating that experience had been for her. She didn't change her position. She was opposed uh, to abortions. She didn't change the opinion of anybody in the group, but they listened. They took in what she had to say. And it only comes when we open our ears to other experiences. So diver, diver, human diversity of the kind that we all have, we have different experiences, different concerns. Those are the things that uh, able us to see things that are different and the ability to see things in a different way allows us to be creative the ability to see things in a different way. Orville and Wilbur, who are from uh, where I am now, um, saw all of the efforts that human beings have made to fly. They put up kites, they had balloons, and they were counting on the air currents to move them through uh, space. The folks uh, that invented the Plane, the, the, the Wright brothers, saw it in a different way. They had a different view. And so they put an engine on an airfoil and they drove it through the currents. They saw it in a different way. And they got the idea from watching pigeons flap and bend their wings. They took in another experience. They had another way of thinking about flight. And that's the reason you can get to California from where I am now. Thank you. We have another question from Valerie and I'll read it for you. Um, what about the research that has shown that small groups move toward greater extrem extremism when allowed to deliberate? Um, that's not what the research shows. There's a very good Finnish study uh, that shows, in fact, if you put small groups in a discussion, they will reinforce one another and they will come out more extreme than they began. <clears throat> but if you put them in a deliberative setting where they have to look at a multiple number of options, where they have to weigh the cost and consequences of all of them, uh, they, in fact, do not come out um, with uh, a more polarized position. They come out with a broader uh, reflective, shared and reflective judgment. It's a very good study. We'll be glad to, uh, uh, Paloma Dallas, my colleague who's with me, um, knows all the literature. She's here in case I say something terribly wrong to correct me and she can get you the Finnish study. It's very, it's very good. And we've been watching deliberations uh, for 40 years. Uh, and what the Finns report is true. Great. Thank you. Okay, we have a, another question here by Wissam. And Wissam is asking, is this crisis of democracy analogous to the end of the old regimes? 
and the aftermath of World War I. Is this erosion of democracy one inherent in the global economic system? Yeah, there is an argument uh, that not immediately after the Second World War, uh, but by the 60s, uh, modern governments had developed uh, in, a, uh, uh, in a, what some call a meritocratic way, highly technical, professional. Uh, I remember one of the first uh, comments on our work in the economy, uh, somebody said that what was wrong with the Kettering research is that they didn't realize that citizens were just obsolete. Too pre uh, a professional, technical world to expect the average citizen to make decisions. It could only be run by professionals. Um, and so uh, beginning somewhere, I'll say the 60s, because there's uh, data there, uh, people began to experience uh, in large institutions uh, in a very different way. They were more professional, they're more technocratic. Um, they, uh, in fact, they tended to look down on people who were not uh, educated, and that's the largest part of our population and any other uh, population. So they felt a lack of respect. They felt like they were being pushed to the sidelines in their own country. Or they felt like their country had made promises to them that they had never delivered. And for different reasons, they were very unhappy uh, with this system of government. Um, the uh, first data I saw on that was in a poll from a, a very good student of human opinion uh, public opinion, uh, Bob Teeter at the University of Michigan. He was writing in 76, publishing in 76. He traced it back to the uh, 60s when, you know, after the Second World War, everybody had a lot of confidence that the government would do the right thing. But after 64, the curve began to go down. And uh, ironically, uh, in response, there were a lot of citizen participation, consultation efforts, and as they increased, uh, the decline in confidence in institutions went down further, leading some people to suggest that what was being done to consult with and, and involved with all you know, good intention was in fact further alienating people because what they wanted was not more facts and more data and more good advice, except in extreme situations like the, the pandemic we just had. But they wanted a different relationship with the governing institution and the governing institution uh, were not at all interested. Uh, they said, here's some data, take it, go home and be happy. They did and they weren't. Hello, uh, Dr. Matthews, I have a question for you. Uh, my name is Tony Clark and, you know, um, my question is this, uh, are we in higher education somewhat hamstrung, uh, perhaps? If we don't get, let's say, uh, any collaboration from, let's say, K through 12, you know, their emphasis is a, a lot different. Uh, yeah, wouldn't yeah. it, uh, or how do you see perhaps the role that uh, K through 12 may play in working along with higher education in the move toward citizenship and democracy? Because to me, it seems like uh, you need to start, you, we need to begin earlier. Uh, uh, you're absolutely right. And here, here are a couple of experiments that we're watching that day. Um, one of the people who's worked with studying, Ken Pierce, uh, is starting uh, with preschool kids. Now, preschool kids were not thought to really have any moral sense to make moral judgment. Um, and they ran a little experiment with these kids in which there were these figures and there were three of them and they were throwing the ball to one another, but one of them took the ball and left. Then later they asked the little kids, here's some cookies. Uh, which one of the ball players would you give it to? And they would only give it to the two 
that remain. They said, why won't you give it to the third one? And they said, the kid said, well, he was ugly. He left. All right. So that's a moral judgment. Uh, so starting in the kindergarten and now in uh, grades one, two, and three, there's a very interesting experiment in uh, uh, Louisiana, Baton Rouge, to, um, it's sponsored in, in fact by the NAACP or the chairman of the NAACP, maybe he's an educator, he's in the program. So they're working. Great program uh, uh, teaching uh, de uh, democratic deliberative skills in the secondary schools. Uh, there's a book out on the subject. Now, if those kids have had that training early on and the colleges and universities were doing the same kind of thing, it would fit good. We're not there yet, but the, the, those, those two are coming together. And, and the, um, uh, the interest in secondary schools in deliberative politics so uh, we got a, a film from one of the New York schools uh, did it. And I remember meeting with New York teachers, you know, veteran uh, teachers from the New York system, pretty tough folks. And I was in the meeting and we were talking about deliberation. And one of them said, you, you mean we're going to have to get our students, our students talking class? Yeah, that, they can't make decisions without talking to one another. And he said, well, you know, uh, our, our rules are that we have to have, have to keep our kids quiet in the class. That's a policy of the New York Board of Education. You're telling us that we have to do just the opposite? I said, yeah, I think so. And he said, fine, let's do it. So there's a readiness. <laughs> there's a readiness for this in secondary education. We have another question from Valerie I'd like to read. Patty, did you want to say something? Yeah, I was just going to mention one thing. Um, I know that there was a question in the chat and then also kind of following up a little bit with, with Tony, but also something that Dr. Matthews was mentioning. Um, Dr. Matthews, do you mind just taking a moment to um, explain this larger idea of deliberative, dial uh, di deliberative uh, dialogues and deliberation, that, that how that has been such a focus of the Caring Foundation and how it's connected with the National Issues Forum. Because I think for a lot of people on, on the Zoom, that this is, this is a relatively new concept that they may not really have realized or understand how it's fitting into higher education or even in, in um, you know, uh, secondary education. And, and I think maybe even to frame that with regard to, and I, I hate to do a plug for, for the Kettering Foundation, but I think it's so important because there are so many incredible resources that are available through um, the Kettering Foundation and, and the website. And, and I think, again, a lot of folks don't know that. Yeah, well, it, it's simple. Uh, we all know what deliberation is. We do it every day. It, it, it's, it, anytime we make a tough decision, we focused on it in politics because politics is about collective action and collective action that doesn't work unless you have collective decision making. So it was a, it was a, it was a no brainer uh, for us to focus there. But um, you don't need to talk to Kettering, you need to talk to the National Issues Forum. These are organizations all across the country. There are any number of them in uh, uh, California, uh, San Diego, uh, I remember in particular. Uh, they are in organizations, uh, the North American Association for Environmental Education uh, does a lot of their work through deliberative uh, forums. And uh, they've done something that you would, I think, find very interesting in this uh, current uh, situation. Uh, there, uh, the forums uh, in, in person are difficult to hold, so they've gone online. Uh, there's a uh, site uh, uh, by the called Common Ground uh, for Action, uh, where there are online forums going on all the all the time. The last report I had, there were thousands of them. Uh, and also, there are now Zoom forums connecting college campuses. Uh, for the first time, we can take the student body in a community college in California and link them to a community college in Texas or, or another 
a state university uh, in Michigan or Ohio. Um, so it's really it's uh, really booming, and there's something called the National Issues Forum Institute uh, that uh, keeps track of all of this, encourages people to join, uh, to participate. A lot of colleges. Uh, in fact, there was just a recent one of, I don't know, 12 or so uh, colleges uh, cooperating with the National Constitution Center or some organization to that name, uh, by that name. Uh, so there, there's, there's a world of deliberation going on. All kinds of organizations sponsored in these forums, colleges, universities, libraries, uh, churches, uh, even some prisons have, have uh, done it. So um, that's the organization that you need to get in touch with and the National Issues Forum Institute. I have a follow-up question and it kind of borrows from what Valerie was asking about. How do you get the disenfranchised folks to engage with this kind of uh, activity? Well, they may be disenfranchised, but they're usually described as apathetic, and they aren't. The only apathetic people are in cemeteries. Everybody is concerned about something and deeply concerned. The problem is that uh, they don't see most of the civic and governmental vehicles as uh, available to them to do uh, the things that, to deal with the things that they are concerned about. And treating them as apathetic and, and trying to motivate them. Uh, just goes nowhere. In, in fact, it aggravates people because they are already motivated by things that they are concerned about. Uh, the people who are trying to engage them want them to be concerned about the things that the engagers uh, are interested in. It doesn't work. You have to start where people start. Dr. Matthews, we have a question from Kim, uh, Kimberly, excuse me. Um, how can you begin to address how our current crisis of citizenship slash democracy might be best addressed at the level of our classrooms slash institutions? In other words, what steps would you recommend these specific audience members take today, tomorrow to help? Well, um, democracy, is a journey, it's not a destination. And there are no roadmaps. It's a journey that you have to make the uh, trip one step at a time. And democracy requires invitedness and change because circumstances are always changing. We've seen that here recently. So I don't want to, I don't have a model for anybody. I don't have any best practices to follow because they stop learning and start imitating. But I, I'm sure given what we've already seen that there are any number of uh, colleges and universities uh, who, and, and secondary schools who are doing this. I know, in fact, I know there are. And they'd be glad to tell you what their experience has been. And that the uh, National Issues Forum Institute uh, has uh, had a list of these. There, I'm confident that there's some uh, near all of the California institutions. So, and even those in Nevada and Arizona would be glad to tell you what they know if they are the nearest to. You. So, talk talk to the people who are doing it. There's a lot of literature available, as was said, through the Kettering Foundation. Um, We'd uh, be happy to share it with you. Just uh, let us know uh, what, uh, what you want. We'll eat, send you a reading list. Uh, we'll put you in touch with uh, the National Research Forum. We'll put you in touch with uh, folks uh, near you or in your uh, particular field. Um, it's, it's, it's not hard to do. 
I want to invite one uh, final question quickly because I see Valerie has put a question in and she has a comment. So I want to invite Valerie maybe to just ask it herself in our last five minutes, Valerie. Oh, maybe we lost her. I don't know that I see Valerie. Okay, we must have lost her off the call. Yeah, yeah, Valerie went to ask somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> We have just about five minutes left. Do we want to go ahead and read Valerie's question or did someone else have a question who's on the call before we have to wrap up? Wrap up. Sorry, so. Oh, she's back. Computer right. issues. Can you hear me? Yep. So I talked to like literally thousands of stu college students trying to get them to register to vote. And they're so offended that we're talking about politics on campus. Just asking them to vote is even too political for them. And they believe that higher education should kind of be like an apolitical space, even though, you know, it was traditionally founded to, to raise um, engaged citizens, right? So how do you, how do you um, push back against their belief that somehow politics doesn't enter the educational space at all. Well, I suspect that what they're reacting to is what's being reported by spread is not politics, but hyper-partisanship. Uh, there are a lot of studies now, I mean, you were on campus, I don't know if this is true or not, but that institutions are uh, hyper-partisan, that people don't feel like they can express themselves Freely without somebody jumping down that throat. So uh, I would think that first something, something's got to be done about that. And uh, students have got to see that institutions of higher education are returning to what higher education is supposed to be, which is a place where uh, different thoughts and uh, adverse opinions are. Uh, not simply tolerated, but welcomed and respected. And once uh, that uh, takes hold, I think you will have less of an adverse reaction uh, to uh, the antipathy that people now feel toward part hyper-partisanship. Uh, that's not politics, that's just hyper-partisanship. And it's mean, it's ugly it's destructive and it's hurting the country. And young people know it, they don't wanna have anything to do with it. But if you get them involved, just forget the word politics, you get them involved with other people in, in uh, students and working on things they care about and making learning to make decisions with people that they aren't alike and don't like them, then you'll get a different attitude about voting. That was the uh, that was the uh, what was reported in the ten year study of Wake Forest. So it's not conjecture. There's good solid research uh, by it, and we'll be glad to send you the Wake Forest book and the other uh, case studies we have. Well, if we are out of time, let me thank you all very much for this opportunity. And thank you for the uh, very good questions. Um, Paloma and I will be glad to follow up with anybody that uh, uh, wants to pursue any of the things that have come up here. I'm glad you're doing this. I'm very grateful for having had an opportunity to be a part of it. So thank you. We wanted to say thank you very much, Dr. Matthews. This has been a great pleasure. And um, again, thank you for taking the time to be with us. Um, and we just appreciate all the work that you're doing and the work of Kettering and um, all the, the amazing publications that you all are producing. Um, and I just wanted to let folks know that we're getting ready to move into the second hour. Um, and for those of you who would like to continue, uh, Kimberly, Jan and I will do a, a bit of a deep dive into some of the, the conversation that happened today. And so uh, certainly I want to say thank you very much
uh, to Dr. Uh, Matthews and Paloma. Um, and you both are welcome to, uh, to stay on if you'd like and, and move into the, the workshop component. But definitely, we also know that uh, you, uh, we want to respect your time. And, and um, I know it's three hours. You, the time difference back there is three hours uh, you know, ahead of us. So again, th thank you so very, very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you, and Thank you, Paloma, also for putting the links in the chat.